Hello, folks. How are we doing? Uh, pleased to see you all here. This is the third in our series of um, game monetization and design uh, masterclasses, and uh, the last in the particular series. Uh, obviously, we want to see how um, this has gone down for you guys and see if it works out. Um, and also, as you may know, we have these hands-on workshops that follow. So the hands-on workshop that follows this will be in two, uh, will be on the 18th of September. So if you want to get some kind of applied uh, understanding of what the techniques we're trying to talk about, then obviously that would be a great thing for you to go for. Uh, I'll talk a bit more about that later. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to assume that you guys already know how to use Zoom. So that hopefully means that you know how to raise your hand, that you know how to do the chat, then you have to set up a Q&A. But just to show that everyone can hear me so I can get some feedback, can I get as many people as possible to press the hands up, please? Can you press up, press the raise hands? Fantastic. I can see Bradley, you're, right, you're waving there. Um, I've got a whole bunch of... of um, hands raised thank you very much that's great i know you can hear me that's that's superb so without further ado because there's so much to go through i'm going to uh, uh kick off and start talking about what we're trying to do today so uh let me just do, move this uh down a little bit so right uh so i'm oscar i am um the uh, CEO of Fundamental Games. I'm a consultant. I'm also a contributing editor here at Pocket Gamer. So I get to talk about a whole bunch of things uh, related to making games and working in the industry. So I absolutely love it. Um, I've been in games since 1998. Uh, I was involved in one of the very, very earliest online gaming services called Wireplay, which is run by British Telecom. Uh, I ran three, the mobile operators uh, platform, which was the most successful in terms of Java mobile games back in the noughties. Um, and I was also home architect on PlayStation Home. And I've been an evangelist for a bunch of organizations, including things like uh, NVIDIA and um, uh, Unity. Um, so I've done a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, most of what I do right now is help people with consulting in terms of game design, monetization, and of course, live ops. Today, we are going to focus on one of the areas where I think it's the hardest to get good information about, and that is how to build balanced game economies. Uh, there's a lot of people who talk about game design, a lot of people who talk about um, monetization, but I find it very difficult to find some really good sources in terms of economy design. So I'm going to share my experience. Bear in mind that I think this is a field that is still evolving. This is a field where there's lots of... Um, lack of, of 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 sharing and i'm hoping that i'm i'm doing a, uh, the right thing by encouraging us all to talk more about how we get best practice in making great games feel even more fun because we create the dynamic uh, equilibrium in them so let's start off with uh it should be able to get me to uh if you, it should be possible to make me uh the spotlight for everybody how about now does that work better for you great perfect so what is a game economy now that's a very big question because i'm going to touch on the economy in the sense of commercial side but that's not what this is it is absolutely pivotal to understanding your monetization design without question but the game economy for me is the underlying mechanics, the underlying system thinking, the flow of the game, the ins, the outs, or as I like to call it, the sinks and sources in the process. It is what keeps people playing and the momentum, the mathematical largely momentum behind the process of play. And our job as designers is to keep that maintained. Now, if any of you have ever played with board game design, fantastic you're going to get a lot of these principles anyway most of where i got my understanding of how to do this came from you know decades of being an amateur board game designer before i ever joined the professional uh, video games industry uh, I, I used to tour around various game shows showing uh, board games that i designed and really to be honest that's a, a lot of the lessons i learned doing that process is what allowed me to be able to do uh, this as a um, professional process in terms of helping people designing their games. So when I say a balanced, you know, dynamic equilibrium, the point about this is that 
if it's static, if there is not a continual need to adjust constantly, the optimization, you will not have a successful game economy. Games are not static. Games are systems. Games are processes, flows. And we need to understand the, the pressures, the flows, the dynamics, the the. Uh, uh, idealism, what we're looking forward to, why we do the next thing, why we feel fear of missing out. All of these things are processes and they are dynamic and they tie back into the same thing I've talked about at each of the other um, sessions. The opening gambit is why do we play? We play because we want that sense of uh, competence. I want to feel good at something. I want that sense of control, the ability to escape from my everyday routine. And I still believe uh, that games are separate, entirely separate from anything to do with earning. I think it's an important factor of what makes a difference between a game and a gambling experience that we know this does not have an impact on our real lives. Um, and now, don't get me wrong, there's lots of debate that we could have about that, but that's not for this conversation. If you want to have a chat with me about that, some other time I'm very happy to talk about the philosophy of this area. Um, completion is another important psychological value add that we gain through playing games. I want to think I did something, it completed, I got a payoff, I got a, a, a response. That completion process is amazing. And particularly when you start doing that in the sense of gathering achievements, unlocking trophies, uh, collecting, those completion processes are deeply psychological factors. And social capital is, again, part of that process. So we're going to remember that that's at the heart of this. And these are items that are constantly in flow. If you want people to stay playing your game, not just creating something which has a start, a middle and an end, you want to be able to let them look at what's over the next hill. And that similarly goes into why people play. Again, I talked about this in the last two webinars. We need that anticipation, that fear of missing out, the sense of social capital and the abnegation, the thing that we can choose as players, but you can't make me do as a designer. All you know, this is the thing that saves us from um, you know, kind of bad patterns if we do this correctly, which is providing space for players to make their own choice. And I'm I'm an advocate of creating ethical, good designs, ethical experiences, because the more that you do that, the more people trust you, the longer they want to keep playing. And the longer people keep playing has a direct correlation to the willingness for them to spend. So I think that, you know, we've got to look at this kind of ethical mindset, not as a compromise, but actually a value. So getting our game economy design balanced but with a dynamism, which means that we have to maintain it, like spinning plates, like um, uh, kind of balancing on a on a on a on a, a, a uh, an unbalanced table. Those things we're constantly moving to keep our place. That is what keeps us engaged. So let's talk about the next part of it, which is understanding the player life cycle, and it's important to think about tapping into that player life cycle because we're not constantly in the same need state and our need states will change if you don't accept and understand that your player's behavior is going to change over time how can you have that dynamic equilibrium you need to know where they are in the life stage the, the life cycle of playing your game whether that's at this point where they're downloading and they just need to know if this is something they're, go they're going to play as they go through onboarding how do we stop losing them and catch them so they stay engaged and then how we retain them so we can then build them up to the level. Hopefully we get to the point where they become fans of what we're doing. So moving swiftly on, let's talk about power and progression. So this is where we start talking about things specific to the game economy. You know, power is our ability to improve through the game, that we need that sense of improvement and progression. But what does power mean? And how do we create an understanding of designing power curves? At its very simplest level, we have essentially, um, you know, money. Oh, uh, you know, oh, I seem to have lost a slide. I've gone too far. This is the slide I was after. We have time. We have uh, effort. Uh, and basically, you know, as we spend our XP, our experience, we increase our abilities, uh, we can take less time and we gain more experience from 
killing more rats. And, and, and basically, everything is basically just a big of rat as we go through playing the game. Now, obviously, I'm reducing to the absurd a little bit. And of course, there's other layers. So we have earned uh, rewards from killing our rats that often takes the form of money. I decide I need a better equipment. I spend my money on a sword. Again, this is the ebb and flow of the experience. And as I carry on playing, I'm looking at optimization through play. And what is optimization? Well, I need to decide, you know, am I going to be looking at kind of like uh, fighting boars? It takes three seconds to kill a boar. I get five experience from killing a boar, but I get uh, 0.5 worth of goods. If I kill a spider, I get less experience, but I get 1.5 worth of goods. So now I've got to decide, do I go for killing more spiders or do I go for killing more boars? I'm, am I... Am I prioritizing as a player my progression in terms of experience? Am I progressing my acquisition, which in turn allows me to improve the rate of, of obtaining new items and therefore, by extension, more XP, channeling my way through the game? So these are the kinds of things we're talking about. This is what are the basic kind of fundamentals of a game economy are all about. Um, moving on from that, we can look at the kinds of types of uh, things that we want in a game uh, and so we've got the subsistence factors again if you were here in the previous i think both of the previous ones but definitely the first one we did we talked about the four types of good subsistence so things i need or i can't play shortcuts things that improve my play uh things like social goods so cosmetic items things i'm using to show off can even be gifts and strategy goods, things which introduce new modes of play or new styles of play that hopefully also improve everybody's experiences joining, not just myself. So getting that right, it really matters. So understanding the, the forms is useful, but we also have to understand the types. And the types can in, come in the form, again, we dealt with this previously, consumables, things. I, I have a health potion. I use the potion, it's gone. That's a good example of a subsistence item i need health or i can't play i have a potion i use it it's consumed but then things like capacity take factors so how many health potions can i hold generators also take a factor how many health potions do i get because i've hired an alchemist in my castle but there's also the other kind of good that i'm looking forward to our aspirational goods and again all of these types and forms have play a part in understanding the dynamic nature in your game. Finally, in this kind of trio of things that we've covered before, but we're going to apply differently here, we have uh, the forms of exchange. We have grind, so things we do in play. We have resources that can be currencies, but it can it, those currencies can be hard or soft, so they can be earned through play or they can be purchased or some combination. They can also be flavored. A resource can be flavored. So Gold is used to buy equipment. Food is used to upgrade uh, characters. Um, uh, goods are used to upgrade uh, trading relationships or whatever else it might be. So specific, specialized use of things can be very, very important. We can also have anchors. What's an anchor? An anchor is specifically a usually a resource of some kind, a currency resource but one which can only be obtained through play. This is what's going to save your life as an economy designer. This has saved me so many times because if you pay attention to the anchor goods, the things that can be locked into in your economy design and focus on making sure that these work, then the additional items that, that can be obtained elsewhere become a lot easier to manage. You can make mistakes in the extra fluff that flavors your player's experience, provided you've got the anchors right, the things that you can only obtain through play right. And a slightly different take on it, but ratchets are effectively limits or conditions we place upon an exchange. I cannot use a level 14 sword unless I'm level 14. I can't upgrade my town hall unless I've upgraded all of my other buildings in my town to level seven before I can upgrade my town hall to level eight. So thinking about those kind of ratchets, those kind of lock-ins, again, 
provide you with another safety net as an economy designer, because it means that you can focus on a smaller number of variables and still flavor the game in all of the exciting narrative things that make players feel good and special, but you've got the basics working. So that's kind of a really important thing. Uh, I'm going to recommend um, uh, a couple of uh, GDC talks because I think these are worth checking out. And I learned a lot from paying attention to these. The first one was um, Exabyte, so Dylan uh, Mayo, uh, who is the designer, I think, at the, or was at the time, I don't know if he still is, I think he still is, designer at the Pokemon Company. Um, he did a fantastic talk talking about uh, card-based progression. He used Hearthstone as his example, showing how, a level seven card is more than the sum of its parts. So we're going to talk a little bit about that in a second. Um, so have a think about, you know, look at the way card games operate. Again, this is the kind of language. If you haven't got experience to collectible card game methods or board game methods, you will start to struggle when you think about designing video game economy systems. They are really good shortcuts to help you understand the process and help you mentally think through the application of rigorous logic against something where it's all about the playful process of a player. Hopefully that makes sense. So let's talk about these these kind of like applications. So these come down to a certain factor. So um, I'll, I'll move myself around a bit because the trouble with um, slides, I always end up in the wrong place. Um, so the first factor of any variable that we can have as a shortcut or a power up or a, or a or a subsistence good is we can have linear impact. That means that it has an impact on one vector. It could be damage, it could be shooting, it could be rate of fire, it could be uh, respawn, it could be any number of things, a linear thing that happens. Now, just so you know, I'm not a huge fan of linear only things. I'm a big fan of using scissor, paper, stone. So a fire sword, plus one fire sword, is still good against a plus whatever water sword. And, you know, it's still going to, or is it the way around? You know, you, you work out what, how your system works. But thinking about flavor having a factor as well as the number means that more things have more value for longer. Again, useful thing to think about. But linear progression, absolutely important. Next up, we have the exchange cost, the actual cost. So if I'm going to place a card that's going to summon a monster that's level three, it's going to cost me three mana. As an exchange, I take mana. If I'm going to um, upgrade my sword from plus three fire to plus four fire, then I need to have the blueprint. I need to have the fire gems. I need to have all these other things, each of which will have an exchange cost. Only when I've gathered all of the items together can I then go to the forge and then I exchange with time to do the process. Oh, and I have a ratchet associated with that because I have to have a high enough uh, crafting skill for me to be able to implement that change and I have to have a high enough level to use that weapon at all. So that's why exchange matters. That's why ratcheting matters. Um, you also got to think about opportunity costs. One of my favorite examples is like shotguns versus machine guns. If you think about a shotgun, you've got a loading time, you've got an aiming time, you've got a firing time, you've got a recoil time, you've got a process of reloading. You do massive amounts of damage during the shot, but there's these buffers, these opportunity costs with another type of uh, attack or, or action that would affect the play process. So they may have the same damage per second, but the opportunity cost if you miss, the opportunity cost if you, you know, the opportunity benefit if you hit, the reload time, you know, the amount of uh, ammo that you have in the magazine, all of those things are factors. Compare that with a machine gun where I've effectively got a line of fire as long as I'm holding down the trigger. I don't have to worry so much about getting the aim right at the, at the initial period Therefore, I have a different type of opportunity cost. All of these are factors in our thinking when we're looking at how we understand the balance of a game. So moving on. Um, the other thing I think is worth bearing in mind is progression shouldn't be flat. What does that mean? So obviously during the early stages, we're starting to develop our character. We need to get a sense of absolute delight the the payoff the reward the value versus the cost and effort the exchange that we're doing 
needs to feel exciting. It needs to feel dramatically powerful. But over time, as that progression changes, as our power curve, as our improvement scale uh, changes, we should see that start to level off. But equally, we should start to get to the point where the effort is now greater than the expected benefit. We're already in momentum. We've got to do more and more. So we know that it's tougher and tougher. And then other benefits come out of it, of course, because we still have have some improvement. But again, this is not necessarily an ideal curve. It's here to illustrate the thinking. Your game will have its own unique understanding of what power looks like. So the strength of your skills, your weapons, how high you can jump, how fast you can move, the exchange rate of certain goods at scale, the rate in which you can build new buildings, and the effect and benefit that gives your units once you've done that. This applies to any kind of game. You have to find out the best way to apply it to your game, but you still come down to how does power work? Power shouldn't be a straight line. Power has to be something which grows immediately, rapidly to give it a level of excitement, but that tapers off. Otherwise, you get to the point where power becomes overbearing and it becomes unbalanceable. Hence why we need to have this kind of S curve style. Well, this is my opinion. This is my view. This is how I approach things. Other people will have their own approaches and thoughts, but this is how I look at it. I'm going to give you one other thing to think about when you're looking at power and exchange rates. Uh, I've talked about this before, but the hot dog economics is something I'm absolutely besotted with as an idea. So think about when you get hot dogs, you get eight buns. Sorry, you get you get six buns and eight uh, hot dogs. OK, so um, you've got six buns, you run out of buns, you've still got two hot dogs. Hot dogs are quite valuable items. So I might as well get some more buns. I get more buns, I get six more buns. I've now got four unused buns. Well, I might as well get some more hot dogs. <clears throat> so this deliberately imbalanced process is designed specifically to create more purchase of hot dog buns and hot dog uh, sausages. Now, you could call that exploitative, but uh, I don't think it, well, in the way we're trying to apply it, that's not the case. This is a metaphor because we need that sense of imbalance. If I do a bit of this, bit of that, bit of that, I want to seek that balance. And someone will remind me, but it's something like 30 odd um, uh, hot dogs and where you get an even balance of, of packs. But the point is not that. The point is encouraging people to feel that they're constantly having to compensate. But it's one of the most most enjoyable moments of a game like Fallout 76 for me. I would go and do a mission, but only once I'd got the equipment to have the right food, the right uh, stim packs, the ammo, um, make sure my equipment was fully fixed, and only then go and do the next mission. And then, of course, I would take damage and so on and so forth, and then I'd go and do the gathering process in order to get the rest of the materials I need to get myself back up to being optimum. That was most of the fun for me in playing something like Fallout 76. I spent more time in that nice, relaxed day, building up my capacity to be ready before I went into the intensity of the mission. So we can look at this hot dog economics as a really powerful way to think. Um, I'm going to tell you another guy who I recommend uh, looking at. This is a Florian uh, from... Um, uh, Wooger, I think it was Wooger. Anyway, the game Jelly Splash. Um, uh, he uses a uh, expletive in this process. I think you'll guess what that word is very quickly. Uh, but to be honest, it's one of the most influential talks I've ever seen on um, thinking about uh, game economies and particularly around the difficulty curve. And the FU moment absolutely changed my mind. So I think it's worth crediting these guys because I think, you know, we should credit people into you know, understanding why we do these things. Nick's just made a comment. The beauty of the hot dog concept is an extra article could potentially be obtained with a different cost so you can use it. To, yeah, exactly. You can use it to add a choice or push another system. Absolutely right. Particularly where you use foreshadowing, where that process introduces a new thing, a new item. I'm particularly a fan of using ad-based rewards to let you try new things and you know, introduce new concepts uh, but that's specifically for mobile games of course 
Okay, so let's talk a little bit about what Florin was talking about. Um, oops, he got too far. First thing is, I want to understand frustration. Now, frustration is not a bad thing. Frustration is absolutely massive, absolutely massive, because if we do not get to the point where we feel frustrated, we don't get to the point where we go, ah, then there is no challenge. And we get bored if there's no challenge. It's, if we go back to Chik Sengmaha, we look at the way the, the balance between frustration and boredom. We want to create that flow state. That flow state does not exist if frustration can't happen. And so we need to think about that. But to remember I talked about doing that against the life cycle of the player. So we're going to show you in a bit a graph, give you an illustration. And Florian does a fantastic job to show that uh, and what he calls the FU mo moment. Um, so frustration and relief, two pivotal things where it has to be challenging. You've got to, you, if you don't fail, if you don't introduce fail early, if you don't establish that you can fail, if you can't put the player into the mindset that they could have failed and they didn't, you're not going to make them feel good about what they did. So that plus foreshadowing, showing what's happening, what's coming, again, massively important. But it comes down to understanding how we make sure we convey that there is actual meaningful choice for the player. Getting that meaningful choice built into the experience is absolutely critical. And, you know, if fundamentally retention doesn't happen if players don't feel they've had meaningful choices, in my opinion. Now, you could argue with idle games. You could argue with the Monopoly Go style games. But I think they are making some level of choice. Um, but I think it's a slightly different rule. I mean, I have I have views on those games. Um, you can't knock them from their re re their revenue model point of view. Um, I think it's really they satisfy a very specific set of needs. But I think they are a different case than most other games. And that's why I still think it's important to think about meaningful choice. Okay, let's talk about balancing difficulty versus rewards. So you want to introduce that kind of, if you look at that line, I've got two lines here. I've got reward versus difficulty. But that reward line could equally say, um, you play a skill, it could equally say um, a number of things. So <clears throat> if you get look at the point in four, there is a big gap between my starting level and my starting capacity, my the rewards I'm going to get from completing this action and the difficulty in that process. That gap matters because you're introducing to me straight away that there is challenge to doing this. But then immediately afterwards, you can see it comes under the line and it stays on the, on the line for the action after that. That's giving me time to feel competent. I have frustration. I learn my technique. I get my technique. I eventually beat that down level. And that is the thing that we call the FU moment. Because you've done it. You know what I'm talking about here. You've be played those games and that darn level will not finish. I can't get past. I just had it a lot when, because I'm slightly dyspraxic, it's a little bit emphasized for me when I play very fast action games. And the number of times I had to retry jumping across onto walls, up um, paths, reaching out with my grappling hook, playing Star uh, Jedi Survivor, sorry. Uh, Jedi Survivor, was, was, I love the game, but oh my goodness me, the number of moments I swore at the screen, absolutely ridiculous, but I didn't stop. I both loved and hated the game. And that intensity of emotion only happens if we get this FU moment. And I argue that it is critical to designing your game economy. Because if you don't know that the vector, not just the static numbers, but the vector of your player's experience, you cannot get the difficulty right, which means you can't get the power curves right, which means the player experience will not be sticky. You will not have created that dynamic experience. This is not just a case of making sure the rewards, the level, the XP, uh, the uh, character of um, skill changes. It's not just a simple case of let's get them right. No, you have to think about what players actually do. How can you show them over the hill? This challenge is coming. God, got to get ready for it. And there's a whole bunch of, of techniques that go with that as well. You know, there's a Nintendo method I'll talk about in a second. Uh, Florian had a fantastic equation, which is really interesting. 
So he, he basically identified a way to calculate this mathematically. I'm a massive fan of this approach. I don't do it often enough, to be entirely honest. But if you look at the number of attempts at something and the number of near wins, now this is the hard part. How do you define a near win? If that number is less than 10, you're probably about right. If it's too high, you'll find that, uh, you know, it's just too frustrating. Um, if you, sorry, sorry, if you, if you find it's too loose, if it's too low, it's too difficult. So, you know, find, find the right number for you, you'll work it out. Hmm. Um, again, just to show this is not just arbitrary stuff. This is something we can actually put maths to. Um, so the Nintendo method, I think a lot of people will know this already. Um, essentially, the Nintendo method, and I'm probably paraphrasing it way in, in different ways. You introduce a concept. You let people confirm that they can do it. That's normally not hugely difficult. You then introduce a challenge. You make it difficult. You now your opponent is more difficult. Uh, you know, so you 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 introduce a concept, you let them master it, you introduce a challenge that makes it more difficult, you make them fail, you let them show them that failure is possible. And then you reframe the problem where they have to apply the same lesson, but in a different way. Again, this is really core to puzzle game design where you introduce systems and then you effectively pervert those systems in order to get people to think about different ways of applying them. Getting that right is absolutely key. And then only then introduce the next concept. What we often find is you want to get all of your onboarding out the way in the first time is your experience. And you say, do this, do that, and you mandate them do those things. I think that's a terrible way to get people on board. But what's it got to do with the game economies? Well, we can't design the systems right if we're not thinking about this stuff at the base level. We have to know how that works, what we're going to get as rewards, what we're going to get as progression, how we're improving the player's experience. We need to know the sinks and sources of how they're going to get that progression. So what I'm basically saying is that a game, a game economy, like the game itself, is a story. It's not just a fixed thing. It is a, it is a vector in its own right. And we have to build the awareness, interest, desire, action, repeat in that flow as much as we have with any other aspect of the game. Hopefully that all makes sense. If anyone has any questions on that, please shout. And again, if you think you've got questions you know, steaming up but they might distract the flow, don't worry. Put it in the Q&A. We'll do it at the end. Um, okay, now we're going to move on to the next section. So we've talked a lot about power, progression, difficulty. So how do we actually map some of that stuff? How do we actually think about putting that into a form where we can actually make some sense of what's going on in the game? <clears throat> and what it comes down to is we basically have to start thinking about the game as, as a system. System thinking, I think, is one of the key skills. And frankly, I wish they taught system thinking in schools. We have a little trick that we use in recruitment. We get people to show us the system of how they make toast. What is the process of making toast? I know it sounds daft, but trust me, it tells you so much about how someone thinks when you get them to map out the process of making toast. No, in this experience here, very simple, a very simple kind of flow. I'm just trying to sort of get you thinking about it. We've got the player, so their character, their levels, their experience, their skills, their equipment, that kind of thing. We've got the activity in the game. We've got their progression. And we've got rewards and offers. Okay, so they're the things, the stables, same points in the game. There is a source for items that affect those items. Uh, there's going to be an effort for that source. There's going to be a supply. You know, restricted supply, scarcity is an important factor. There may also be offers. So this is generally purchasable items. Um, you've got things like optimization. So actions that we can take to optimize the rate in which we can gain items from a source. Typically, that's affecting the effort over time, over level, for example. And scarcity, as I mentioned, is an important factor. So what does that deliver? Well, those sources deliver resources, some of which can be anchors, some of which can be factors related to ratchets. Fantastic. And then when we've got those items, and again, like I said before, they can be hard currencies, soft currencies, they can be flavoured currencies, they can be experience points. And then we sync them. And there's an exchange rate. 
And that exchange rate affects our players' abilities, attributes, equipment, etc. It affects how we can then act in the game. It affects our progression through the game. And it allows us to unlock those rewards and offers. So again, thinking about the sink as the supply and the source, sorry, the, the source as the supply and the sink as the demand. Hopefully that makes some sense. So what am I going to do with that? There is, there's a couple of techniques. I'm going to talk about three techniques and then give you an example of the one I tend to use. So technique number one is, if you may have seen this, if you're involved in the previous um, uh, engagement retention design, I'm a big fan of this very simplified model of sync and source analysis. So I've got my player, my action, my progression. I've chucked in a seasonal event. I've chucked in rewards and offers as separate items. But basically, I'm going to put an item in. So I might have an action. I put time in. My time allows me to get experience points. Fantastic. I then have my experience points and I put my experience points into progressions. I sync it into progression. And then I get my um, level up uh, as a result. Or I might get a reward as a result of the progression. I might get a reward as a result of the action. Um, I might put time into the seasonal event. I might get seasonal specific rewards and experience or currencies. I then sync those into rewards and offers. I think those rewards and offers give me items I can use to upgrade my um, player. So I can sync those into my player to upgrade that. And then that provides me with improved levels, et cetera, et cetera. I can even get other short-term consumable things like shortcuts, power-ups, uh, those kind of things that then improve my ability to play, speed up my process, and therefore I can sync them into the action column and get more of that experience and rewards. So this is a very easy, it's actually kind of basically double entry bookkeeping. Where do you get something from? Put it in the column. Where do you get it out? Put it in a column. Just lets you see what's going on in the game very quickly. And what's important is also you get a sense of how frequently those things can work through. And getting that frequency to work through is really important. Now, remember what I said before, though, we've got to think about this in terms of our subsistence good, our short, uh, our, our shortcuts, our social goods, and our uh, strategy goods. These are factors that are going to be effective. So we can flavor the ins and outs, the sinks and sources using this. We can also go further. We can again use the types. So is it consumable? Is it capacity? Is it a generator? Is it an aspiration good, something I own? So again, it allows us to think how we can create these models to track what's going on in the game and, and be able to understand the flow. As well as that, we can think about the, the different forms of exchange. Again, grind versus resource versus anchor versus branding. Now, some of this is actually kind of incorporated by the very fact that I've separated rewards and offers. But again, it's still useful to track. Um, so what does that leave us with? That leaves us with a model like this. Uh, so here I've got uh, cosmetic items, which I sink into my player. Therefore, my player now has that item. I have upgrades. That lets me upgrade my equipment, my character, etc. I then have health that I can regain. It's it's because of the, having the character rest gives me health. I then spend my health through playing the game. Uh, I also invest time in playing the game. And I can invest power-ups that I've obtained through... Uh, in fact, I've just realized I can't see where the power-ups are on the thing. But you would typically have your power-ups come from your rewards uh, or various other things like that. Um, I've got XP that I get as a result of of doing the action, that XP is sunk into progression. Uh, that progression goes into a progression variable, which feeds into rewards. Uh, and then again, that, that allows me to unlock things like new roles, upgrades, and so on and so forth. Um, again, this is I've done this in a very abstract way. Uh, if you're involved in the interactive, we're going to go through this in detail. You're going to pick a game. We're going to identify how you break down and see where the sinks and sources are. And the joy of this is you can then apply numbers and metrics to them, a rate of drop. You can apply things like um, the, a, a attributed value, player value versus underlying core value. Again, it allows you to do a whole bunch of things. You can then think about things like ad view, IAP, VIP. And again, how do you restrict the scarcity and supply and use the tools available to do that? Uh, you'll notice I've got like flags on most of the post-it notes. So I've got a burger to represent consumable. I've got an anchor to represent an anchor good. Uh, and also color code of the card so I can see health is a subsistence good. Uh, purple is a social good. You can see the kind of way I would do it. Now I've got a map. I can actually see 
the economy of the game, where things are going in and coming out. I can see if I've got too many sources and too few sinks. If I haven't got a sink for something, like for example, I've got no source on this one for power-ups, so I need to work out where the power-up source is. Well, it's probably going to be coming from our rewards. Or it could potentially come as uh, as um, bundles that is an offer that we can make available to be purchased to be exchanged for being a VIP member, for um, spending money on IAP or watching ads, which again, effectively is a time sink. Hopefully that will make sense. So alternatives, ways, or where you can take this next. Um, so I, I tend to take this into a spreadsheet and work that out brute force. But there's a methodology called a Monte Carlo simulation. I don't tend to do this because it's a little bit far on Excel for what I need for most of the games. It's a little bit overkill for me because I'm tending to come in as a, an advisor for teams trying to fix broken games more often than not. Um, but the model is still very useful. Again, as I said, you you need to know what the sinks and sources are. You need to know their likely drop rate. You need to know what their uh, essential value is. And then you need to apply that and let the simulation work through where the bottlenecks might be in the way pe people might play through the game. I've done this very manually, like, as I say, brute force for a number of game economies. Um, you've basically got to be very aware of uh, extreme optimization and also reverting to the mean. You know, so basically, if you just do averages all the time, you're not going to get a true picture, but you get a good picture of the base of your experience. You've also got to experiment with the edge cases where people put all of their effort into one aspect or another and see how quickly that breaks the game. Again, this is where anchors and ratchets can save the day because an anchor and ratchet can prevent someone diving deep just to get as much gold as possible. I don't care how much gold you've got. If you haven't got the, the blueprints, you can't buy upgraded equipment. And you have to have played. Therefore, I have to know how far you got through the game. Therefore, I know what your power progression looks like. Therefore, I know what your difficulty progression looks like. The anchor allows me to track it. Hopefully that makes sense. And similarly, the ratchet. The ratchet is the same principle. So that's another one. There, there are some other tools out there. Um, so if you look at um, Machination, uh, I'm a big fan of Machination. In fact, I've uh, cheekily snuck in a little affinity uh, affinity, uh, affinity code. Uh, there's a 5% uh, offer if anyone goes down there. Um, what I find really useful about this is I can, again, take out my map uh, and then start building in some of those configs and see dynamically live how that operates. Again, very useful tool. Overkill for some games, really interesting for others, can get very deep in others. But I'm genuinely a fan, definitely worth checking out machinations and other tools like that. But there's a lot you can do in Excel, there's a lot you can do in other tools, but it's amazing how far you can get just by doing that mapping process. And as I say, the key thing here, if you can understand this map, you can then work through the rest of your economy, you can start setting prices but then what's the important thing? As much modeling as you might do, what matters is data. Getting the data right is key. You need to understand how you can use your data for forecasting. You can use it for testing. You can use it for performance. And as I always say, when you're doing game economy design, make sure all of the config settings for what the values and payoffs and drop-offs of each of the items could be Put it on the server. So every time you run the test, you don't need a new build in order to adjust your settings. Make a bet. Your bet will be wrong. Tinker, tinker, tinker until it feels right. And what's interesting is generally an actually balanced economy never feels right. It always feels either nerfed or overpowered in some angle. And often you need that continual suck that draw off of the balance so you're constantly having to adjust and put more time effort and sometimes if you haven't got the time and effort the money in order to keep the balance ticking over if there is no net draw no net sink why would anyone ever spend any money in your game so it's essential for designing game monetization now Hopefully that's been useful and interesting, got you thinking. Um, now, the best value you're going to get is if you then go back, if you haven't already, go check out the recordings we did 
for monetization design. And go check out the recording we did for engagement and retention design. Those things tie very neatly with this thinking. And also, we're going to be doing this workshop where, whilst I've been talking very abstractly, you're going to get to actually apply these, this thinking to a game. Now, we'll, we'll work on that process um, and um, essentially we'll take you through the step-by-step -step so you can get a clear idea of how do you make sure that you can map your game to that process. Uh, I will answer the question. Uh, the um, the links are all on Pocket Gamer. I will make sure I find those. In fact, Catherine, um, I think you're still there. Um, if you don't mind, would you mind digging out the um, the links to the uh, the recordings? If we haven't got it by the time I, we've answered any other questions, then they, they are on YouTube somewhere, I believe. Um, I just go get the links for them. I share them. I share them on our my my uh, Discord group um, for the game teams that we talk to. Uh, but also, I'll be posting them out, um, you know, to various platforms like UK uh, Industry Slack and stuff like that. Um, if you're part of Level Up or if you're part of the video game um, uh, VGI group, uh, I also try to make sure I make them available there as well. Um, so. Um, we will get you that those links uh, and go from there. Now, in the meantime, um, obviously we rushed through that pretty quickly. There's a lot of knowledge and information in that. Um, so let's um, let's see if we've got questions. We've got a question here. Could I give another example, or a repeat past example, of the hot dog economics concept in the game? So uh, an example of this, I mean, the best one for me is if you look at... Um, um something like clash of clans i mean there's or, or actually no better yet let's look at something like clash royale those kind of games where we are going to get a bunch of cards that we're going to be able to uh apply um i think it was clash royale that did this i i sometimes get confused about which games i saw which technique but let's the abstract technique would be this i have to collect a bunch of level three cards i collect four of them i then burn them cut into a one level four card so i'm constantly needing more cards of a type in order to get the next type of card uh, another example in fact probably a better example in some ways because that that example shows the burning the sinking side um and another example would be um in order for me to be able to uh unlock yeah i will go with the clash of clans example i need to unlock my my um town hall in order to unlock my town hall to level eight my mana uh, vault my mana mine my gold vault my gold mine my uh, barracks or whatever the other buildings are i forget it's been a long time since i played have all got to be leveled up to level seven so i'm constantly having to move things up uh, in order to be able to then unlock the next one um, those are the sorts of things that I would I would be thinking about. So another example might be um, ammunition. Uh, so I'm I'm trying to um, I use Fallout seventy six as an example there. So I need to make sure I've got enough, I'm enough ammunition to carry, but I've got a capacity to how much I can carry at any one time. <laughs> I need to use different resource types to be able to get that, you know, to create that ammunition or to source that ammunition by finding it or making it. I need to make a factory maybe in in some examples. Uh, that's more uh, Fallout 4 than it is Fallout 76. I'm a bit Fallout obsessed. Apologies if you're not into it. Um, then, you, so you're constantly having to get more ammo. You're constantly having to get more uh, improvements to your armor, repairing your armor, repairing your weapons because they can get damaged over use. Uh, so you are constantly having to craft, which takes time out of the combat process, which is actually relief. Perfect. Then I go and do my mission. I fight in that mission. I'm using up the ammo. I'm taking damage to my equipment. I'm taking damage to my weapons, but I'm gaining experience points. So I'm constantly having to shift between getting more stuff, using up more stuff. That happens best because each item has a level of capacity to how good is good how full it is so a fully equipped armor is full when i take damage it's it um reduces uh, and then i have to repair it back up to full <clears throat> um and of course the, the risk in this is if i go too high a level 
I take too much damage. I lose all of my armor. It's now completely broken. I'm now at risk of, of, of losing my character as a direct result. I mean, obviously, you recover, but you know I'm coming from. Uh, does that give you, uh, anonymous attendee, does that give you enough of a, a response, an, enough of an idea? Mm. I'm hoping that that does. Uh, right, so any other questions? Actually, I've got the uh, engagement retention design uh, link I'm going to put here. This is the uh, engagement retention one. Um, and... Yeah, I was trying to find the other one. I know it's there somewhere. I think Catherine's going to find the other one. Okay. Um, any more egg, Any more questions, folks? Uh, I can see, Gustav, you're looking into Monte Carlo simulation. Yeah, definitely worth looking into. Um, main reason I don't do it is because I end up having to do this stuff um, quite late. Yeah, I just posted it in chat above, literally above you, Shuggan. Um uh, if anyone wants to reach out to me directly, um, then you can find me on Oscar at fundamentally.games or I'm on Twitter and various other places at Athanasius. That's at a... Oh, that's weird. I, oh, I know why. I did it to hosts and panelists. Apologies. My bad. It should have gone to everyone. I didn't pay attention to that bit. Cool. So, um... As I'm as I mentioned before, oh, here we go. How do you design PvP based game economy or progression system? Exactly the same way as you would deal with um, PVE, but you don't need to have a PVE to be able to do it. You're looking at the power. So remember, we talked about power curves and difficulty levels. So the variable here, the anchors here, are going to be having some form of matchmaking variable. I would suggest this is how I would look at it. Um, so if you're looking at, um, um, so the, there are a couple of issues with any PVP. One is critical mass. The other one is being able to do good matchmaking. And for me, good matchmaking, ELO style rating systems are quite useful, uh, but you don't always have the luxury of exact matching based on different people's different skills and different roles. Different people have different IP, you know, stability, uh, you know, connection stability. Um, and, and various other factors. But let's ignore that for now. You still want to be able to match people into a category of players or you're going down the route where you're, you're balancing through team. So there are various ways of doing that kind of balancing. Um, you can also do rubber banding if you do it in play. Um, uh, if you don't know what rubber banding is, it's a method for, particularly came around for things like Mario Kart, but you can use the same model where essentially you do aim assist and damage uh, improvements to allow people to catch up or feel they have a fighting chance. There's a risk with that because if you do it too overtly or if you make it too easy, you undermine the skill factor of the player. And the skill factor is absolutely critical, but it means that your matchmaking approach has to be rock solid. So the way I would deal with it is that S-curve model of unlocking access to ability is the really key thing in so the next weapon, the next weapon. You want to make people feel like they're getting the next best weapon, but there is a risk if you go too far. It becomes increasingly impossible for low-level players to play with high-level players. Now, I actually have a prefer preferred method for this, which I saw um, James um, um, Portman, Pat, uh, Pat Moore, um, anyway. Um, a whole bunch of folks have done this in in things like Call of Duty versus other things. But the first time it ever existed was in Quake mod called Weapon of Choice. In Weapon of Choice, if I killed you with the, you know, if I killed you with the rocket launcher, I'd lose access to the rocket launcher until you killed me again somehow. And it would carry on like that. So if I kept losing, if I kept killing you and you kept losing, I would lose access to more and more weapons until I was down to an axe and you still had access to the rocket launcher. That was the most fun I've ever had being a rubbish player against some of the top 10 UK players and I could shoot rockets at them and they could only hit me with axes. It was terrifying, but brilliant at the same time. So like I say, there are different ways of handling it, but again, it's about understanding the progression and difficulty and then applying that with that S-curve progression level so that you're, 
you're minimizing that sink source cost so that you're getting the best balance for the player. Does that make sense? Yeah, Josh, let me know if you think that makes sense. Um, I, and by the way, if he doesn't, that's fine. We'll, we can carry on talking about that as well because I think there's a whole bunch of nuance around that. As I say, two ways of looking at it, um, but we are there. Right, so let's have a look. Um, so Josh, uh, sorry, Jude, rather, uh, we should now have the links to the um, videos uh, in the chat. So please shout if, you, if you're having any trouble finding that. Uh, brilliant. Thanks, Josh. Really appreciate it. Um, next up, um, anonymous attendee is asking, would you, uh, what would you say is the most vital role in onboarding from an economy design point of view? Um, for me, it's make the player feel they can fail they need to feel powerful, but they also need to see where they're going if they stay playing, not just for days, but weeks, months, even years. So there's these three things. You know, I need to feel powerful or why am I playing? I need to know I can fail and my choices are meaningful. I need to know there are going to be ongoing things that are going to make me want to keep playing. You can't get people to stay playing unless you communicate those things. Every single time I've tried to do that, that's been the biggest chance to get those three things. And do you know, you know what? You can see it. You create a funnel analysis. You look at the flow and you make sure those three things are there. But the reason why those three things also work is because the the foreshadowing part is the uh, our ability to look at the long-term economy. And we need to see how the player can make their own path with the sinks and the sources so they can build up that process to get to that, not end stage, but that um, maintenance stage, that optimization state. <laughs> By doing that, we can, you know, we can map that in terms of drop rates, in terms of, of value proposition. Again, value can be a number of different forms, but thinking about drop rates and value is going to allow you to see what optimization looks like. And again, that S shape, that sharp growth, leveling off, balancing out. So we still get the perception of progression, even if the actual net score doesn't change that much that's the that's the sweet spot but there's also some fantastic techniques you can do to reset i'm not saying going down the pillars of eternity where we reset the whole ecosystem every three months that's a bit overkill i, I love that it exists as an option don't get me wrong absolutely love that it exists but it's the it's a complicated process i'm much more thinking like a like a soap opera how do we introduce a new thing how can we twist and pervert it how can we then challenge you on it how can we make you master those things so um nick you were asking me to just repeat the three things so the first thing was i need to feel powerful for the first time user experience the second time the second thing is i need to feel i can fail and um the third thing is i need to have foreshadowing of why i'm keep coming back because if i don't have that foreshadowing I won't have that effective uh, result. Hopefully that answers the question. Did that, oh, uh, oh, sorry, yeah, uh, yes, sorry, yeah. <laughs> very, very good point. Nick makes a fantastic point. I misread his, his question. I thought it was a question. You're actually saying the key thing is to repeat that as you add new items, absolutely. Make me feel good. Make me feel challenged show me there are more things to get absolutely key absolutely key and repeating that throughout the game that keeps the game fresh and, th and that's the beauty of seasonal events we can have a themed activity my favorite seasonal event was done by a game called art of war legion when i did some consultancy for those guys i said to them you made a massive mistake but you hit on something really powerful what they did is they created an event which was to kill cerberus everybody contributes to killing cerberus Cerberus had a finite amount of hit points. That meant Cerberus was set in order to have about, I don't know, 24 hours, three days worth of hit points. So it would take three days to kill it if everybody played to the most extent. And they then it, they even capped how often you could fight Cerberus to once every, I think, eight hours, I think it was. Uh, the net result was that it was so, so exciting that everybody killed Cerberus within the first 24 hours. 
wasting the whole experience. But had they done this, so divided each uh, player into one of three factions, like Pokemon Go does, red, yellow, green, and add up how much damage the people in that faction do to Cerberus in total. He doesn't run out of hit points over time. He runs out of hit points in this session, giving a finite into that session, and keeps coming back until the end of the month. At the end of the month, you tell them which faction won. You give a whole bunch of rewards to that faction. So anyone, he even fought Cerberus once, gets these bonus rewards, feels part of that process, and then you set up a challenge that makes it harder for that team to win the second time and a new monster giving the rest of the party chance. To Again, that's a, an example of a, a, very, a very simple way of thinking about the economy differently. Rather than a finite amount of hit points ever, have an infinite amount of hit points, but a finite per session and count up how much damage was done. It's a very different way of calculating the process. So Josh is asking, how do I feel about Web3 games? Um, so uh, I, I designed one of the very first uh, Web3 games, um, the first one that was ever approved by Apple, a game called um, uh, Rousey Clash. It didn't do very well, that's life. You know, we we had a bunch of problems. The uh, ran out of money before we could actually finish the, the economy design, so we never got round to finishing the process, sadly. The, the, the games industry is full of that. My career is full of that. Um, the key thing, though, is uh, what we did in designing that token system was we built in scarcity into the tokens. We built in so anyone could use the tokens with any game, not just our game. We actually used blockchain in that process as a design that could not be done better as a database. Every single design I have seen since is better as a database. Every single one. Uh, there is one exception, possibly Sandbox. Uh, in fact, there there are. Let's, uh, I'm being a bit unfair. I'm being a bit unfair. There are a handful of very good folks. The Animoca guys, um, Seb at um, Sandbox. Uh, they they are doing a great job, especially because they're they're focusing on the same in Sandbox's case. They're focusing on the creation of an asset and uh, effectively attributing you value for the work that you've contributed. That I think is solid. But unfortunately, ever since I did that work, the only people who have ever approached me about blockchain have either been crooks or uh, basically tech bros who have no understanding of what makes gameplay gameplay. And this is the thing I said right at the beginning. The difference between a game and other systems, play to earn, gambling, and a lot of blockchain games, is a game is separate from your real life. If you have something which you own that you can resell, that changes your relationship with the game. It changes the nature of the game. And to date, I have never seen a gamified thing be as effective as a game. So my view is very open to the technology. There's some really smart stuff. Uh, I've done a lot of thinking about how to use it well. I'd like to think I did a good job of that. Um, but the reality is there are very few actual use cases that could not be done better with the database. So uh, Josh is continuing saying, uh, I guess the question he has is essentially with a real difference between, say, the DMM in RuneScape with price pools running atop. Yeah, I mean, this is a very, this is where the, these are the edge cases that become very difficult. So um, having a separate section, for example, um, Nitro Nation, I think it was called, the racing game by the guys that did a um, drag racer. Anyway, um, uh, Creative Mobile, uh, Estonian team, very, very lovely team. They added a uh, essentially a betting on your race mode of play for the subset of players who went into that mode. They had a great time. It's fantastic. I'm not sure how long it lasted in terms of revenue. It didn't last a hugely long time, but it was a good example. Um, Prize pools is another interesting one. It's again depends on how they're structured. The real issue comes down to cashing out. One of the issues with cashing out, by the way, if you want me to go into a deep, deep detail about my experience looking at how to do this stuff, particularly around setting up gambling services, which I have done, would never do again, but I learned so much. I'm glad I did it. Know your customer. Know your customer. This is the one thing actually I gained from working with gambling people. I learned so much about know your customer and the security that goes with that. 
and the con consumer care that's necessary, particularly when you're dealing with vulnerable people. And actually, there's a lot of lessons that we in games can learn from that. I don't think we've got the same risks and issues. Don't get me wrong. So we can learn from it. So prize pools can be really valid validation, but you need to be very careful, particularly around the, I think it was still the 2006 Act. It may have changed, maybe been updated since then. But there's lots of very specific rules and legislation. And I think the legislative exposure where someone can cash out with prize pools uh, and in particular, you know, where there's play to earn, there are some very challenging aspects to that. Now, one example of play to earn uh, are things where like something like Antidote or Playtest Cloud, where you're being paid to playtest something. Completely different subject, completely different experience. I'm a huge fan of, of that kind of approach. But in that case, every player is going in to test a game they know is not finished. That's really interesting. They're not there to play. They are there to work at testing, but they behave as players. So again, I think keeping a separation between play and work can be very powerful. So when it comes down to economy design, I tend to avoid doing prize pools uh, where it's cash out and uh, pay to earn. I just don't think they're adding enough value compared to the legislation and responsibility costs that they then require upon you. And to a certain extent, I would say the same thing about blockchain. The backlash in the industry from consumers is real, um, particularly because of the malpractice by some people where they have tokenized assets they don't own at the expense of people who generated that material in breach of copyright. And essentially all they're really offering is a URL, which could be replaced easily, making you lose the thing you've spent money on. So until someone has some sort of a more appropriate structure for doing that, I'm a little bit sort of I, I'm, I'm sitting here with an open mind, but uh, I have concerns. I have questions. Let's say that. I've got questions. So, Josh, I don't know if that answered your question. I hope it did. Um, we are past time. I'm very aware. Um, we have a whole bunch of people still here. Thank you very much for staying with us. Uh, I'm very happy to keep uh, hanging on answering questions, but I will give people a chance to head out. Um, thank you very much for taking part in this. Um, if, you're, if you found it interesting, please don't forget that there is a special offer because you turned up because you stayed here there is a code web3 if you go and and sign up to the the hands-on so basically the stuff we've been talking to but where you get to do it and you get me to help you work through the process and thinking so that you know how to do it yourself apply to web3 and you'll get an extra 10 percent off which means if you if you put sign up by friday you get that 10% off the £150, not the full price 300 which comes into effect after Friday. So go out there, sign up now, take part in this, and you join me where we work with together in teams and we work through the process so that you get to do this stuff and learn how to do it yourself and how you can apply it in your own games. Cool. Okay. Thank you very much, folks. Uh, see those of you. I, I go, I'll see you in two weeks. Uh, and again, uh, please feel free to shout out. And thanks, uh, Catherine, for putting the link to the Eventbrite in there. If anyone wants to talk to me at any point, you've got me. Uh, I'm, I'm easy to find. Uh, I am um, Oscar at Fundamentally.Games. I am Athanasius on various social posts. And I will see, Timo, I'll definitely see you in Helsinki. Uh, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, and again, guys, thank you very much for attending. I hope you found it useful. Sounds like a lot of you got a lot of value. I'm very pleased about that. As I say, this is something that's really hard to find other sources of information. I'm actually going to be hopefully writing a book for Focal Press on the topic. And again, any feedback you guys are willing to share with me, I'd be very grateful for as well. On that note, I think we're done. Thank you very much, all. Have a good evening. Mm -hmm.